I wanted to share with everybody recent national statistics that really support why we need to talk to our kids about this and talk to them early and continue to talk about them. First of all, um, young women are reaching puberty and sexual matur maturity earlier than ever. Just in the 1990s, um, the average age of menarche was 15. Menarche is, you know, onset of men's seeds. The average age of menarche in the 1990s was 15. The average age today is 12 and a half. 12 and a half. That means over 50% of girls are starting menstruation at ages 9, 10, and 11. I don't know. We don't know. We don't know. We just know that they're menstruating earlier and earlier. Is it the nutrition? Are we overly, you know what I mean? Are we overly nourished and they're reaching that um, kind of uh, minimum weight and minimum fat percentage that they have to have to start menstruating? I mean, that might be part of it. Um, so we'll see. But 12 and a half is. And you know, menarche means they can get pregnant. So it's, it's, a, it's a big deal. It's a big change. Nearly one half of high school students reported having had sexual intercourse. That's 50%. Oral sex may actually be more common than vaginal sex. Over 56% of high school students admitted to having oral sex. So oral sex uh, it seems to be becoming more common than vaginal sex. The, pre the prevalence of sexual activity certainly increases with age, with 33% of ninth graders stating they're sexually active. And by the time uh, you talk to the high school seniors, 65% are active. So I mean, I mean, this is a reality. These are national statistics. These are good numbers. This is data based on 50,000 interviewed teenagers. So I mean, these are the latest national statistics. There are, of course, risks inherent to be choosing, choosing to be sexually active no matter what age you are. One out of four girls aged 14 to 19 are infected with at least one sexually transmitted infection. There are 19 million sexually transmitted infections that occur each year, of which half are in adolescence. The highest rates of chlamydia in the United States are in girls aged 15 to 19 and 75% of them are asymptomatic. These are the two viruses that I see every single day in my office. And I see them in adolescence. And um, the first one is human papillomavirus, which I know has gotten a lot of press recently because in July of 2006, Merck came out with the Gardasil vaccine, which includes four subtypes. Remember, there's over 100 subtypes of, human, of HPV, over 100. But the four most common, the ones we really do see every day, we do have a vaccine now for. And the most exciting news, um, hot off the press, is that three or four weeks ago, uh, the FDA approved the HPV vaccine for boys age 9 to 26, which is huge because that's where these girls are getting them, are from asymptomatic adolescent boys or older boys who are carrying the virus and have no symptoms. And this is how this keeps getting spread. So this is uh, really exciting. It's been approved for boys age 9 to 26. So. So we do have that. That's the good news about HPV. The other good news really about HPV is that if you do get the infection and you're a healthy young female, you are probably going to clear the infection. You have an 80 to 80, 85% chance of clearing the infection on your own within 24 months. So HPV kind of has some good news to it, but it is uh, certainly very prevalent with 5.5 million new cases of HPV every year. Uh, 25 million American women have HPV and one quarter of those are adolescent females age 14 to 19. The second virus I really, or second uh, other STI I really wanted to highlight tonight is uh, herpes, um, herpes simplex virus. There's type 1 and type 2 and um, these are the cases that never leave me when I have the 16 year old girl who walks in who can't walk because she's in so much pain and has a primary herpes infection and just had sex for the first time in her life six days ago. You know, it's all it takes is just one partner and now you have an incurable disease that will recur four to five times a year for the rest of your life and may require that you have to have a c-section when you do decide to have kids. So it is, um, you know, it's, it's more devastating in a lot of ways than human papillomavirus. 
even though human papilloma virus can cause genital warts and cervical cancer and rotten things too, and a, way too many visits at your gynecologist's office, herpes is really devastating. It really is. It's lifelong. There are 65 million Americans infected. It has an equal prevalence in rural and urban, po urban populations. This is not something where we see, like inner city, we see a lot more chlamydia, gonorrhea, HIV, syphilis. This HSV, herpes is everywhere. No one is immune to it. It's increasing every day among whites and teens. Um, there, there is no cure. There is no vaccine. There is, a, you know, an antiviral med you can take to make the outbreaks shorter to try to protect future partners. But um, it's, it's a bad one. This is more from that social data. Here it is: the Sex Information and Education Council of the United States. They get together with um, the United States government, with the Guttmacher Society and Planned Parenthood, and they're the ones that really do all of the um, data on, on adolescent sexuality. They're the ones that really go out and get all this information and update it every year. Um, and I really pulled these out because I thought these were important. Uh, risk of misperception in the adolescent population. So for kids who aren't educated or whose parents didn't have uh, the continued conversation with them, one in five young people, and these were age 14 to 19, uh, the people that were surveyed, said they would just know if their partner had a sexually transmitted infection. One in six said sexually transmitted infections can only be spread when symptoms are present. And one in 10 think oral sex has no risk. And this really all ties into the herpes slide, and this is why I put this up because um, the herpes virus, as you all know, is the same virus that causes fever, blisters, or cold sores. And so if kids are thinking, oh, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna stay a virgin, I'm not gonna have vaginal sex, I'm just gonna have oral sex with my partner, and that partner has a cold sore and doesn't know that that's the herpes virus, then I see that girl in my office a week later with primary genital herpes outbreak from her partner's oral cold sore. Now it's not as bad as the traditional HSV2 or traditional um, genital herpes, but HSV1, which causes the oral uh, sores, is, uh, it's still herpes, it still hurts, it's still incurable, it's still lifelong, and now she has it on her genitalia because she thought oral sex was safe. So, and there is asymptomatic shedding of the herpes virus. So if you're a carrier, whether it's orally or genitally, you can shed the virus and have absolutely no symptoms. Now it's much harder to contract that way, but um, you know, if you're regularly active with that partner, there's still a risk to get it. And same with human papillomavirus, you can have absolutely no symptoms and be shedding the virus. 